Hey everyone, it's Stephanie again, and you are tuned into the review of Married at First Sight, Season 13, Episode 4. All right, before we get started, don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can be the first to find out when I post these videos. All right, guys, let's just get into it. This is the time that I have in the car, so I figured it's now or never. So this week's episode, I really enjoyed this week's episode. I mean, it was a little drawn out, but they, we've come to know that that is what Married at First Sight is about. But we have finally, everybody's married. Everybody's met at the altar. Um, they have their first night together. They get to have um, brunch with each other's family members and friends. And then they all go to the honeymoon. And it pretty much ends with the first night at the honeymoon kind of just getting settled in. Um, so let's just kick it off with Merla and Gil. So Merla and Gil, listen, I feel <laughs> Merla and Gil for me is like the calm before the storm type of couple. Um, simply because I just see like red flags that I don't necessarily think is going to make for a long lasting relationship like I could see where they could be good together but I don't know that either one is really going to make the effort to really stay together stay the course um but right now Merlin and Gil are pleasant to watch I think they get along well they're both attracted to each other they're both attractive people um they get along they have a little banter he kind of already knows that she's kind of like um sassy you know she's sassy she's gonna push back a little bit he he likes that there's a part of him that likes that um He's not thrown off by her independence. Um, you know, they, they're they cool. I think they're happy right now. Um, they obviously know that there's like little stuff that's like, okay, wait a minute, that may not work long time, long term, but so far so good. Um, Merla and Gil, the night of the wedding, get to the room, they kind of relax a little bit. And a big commonality that they find that they have is both of them are missing their fathers. Um, and they both have fathers who were unfortunately murdered. So when I, when I saw that part, I was like, wow, it's really, really uncanny how they were matched together and they have a very similar trauma. Like they both have the loss of their fathers and, and that's huge in itself, but also the way, the unfortunate way that they lost their fathers through such violence. Um, a lot of people can identify with that. So the fact that they can come from the same place in that way is definitely gonna be a trauma bond for them. Um, and trauma bonding, because it's traumatic, it often allows you to bond significantly quicker and deeper than just the traditional getting to know you slowly. Because when you identify with someone um, who has such significant trauma, it's like a magnet. Um, and I understand you, you understand me in a way that most people don't. So that could be something um, I, I wouldn't say good for them, but in a way, a good way for them to enhance their relationship just by trusting each other more um, through sharing that experience. But then here I am, if I've shared like probably the worst thing that's happened to me, then I can share other stuff. Um, Gil shares it that night. She shares it the next morning. Um, and that just, that was just really, that was really tough to watch and really just sad to hear about. Um, so moving on, they end up going to each other's family and friends for lunch. So first, Merla, Gil meets with Merla's brother and two friends. So no girls are on Merla's side, which is interesting. It made me wonder um, what her relationship is like just with women and, and that dynamic. Is there trust issues? What's, you know, what's going on? There's something there. She did have bridesmaids, so she has female friends um they went you know dress shopping with her so maybe they weren't available for that lunch but it was just interesting how Gil came in and sat with three men one of them appropriately being her brother um and he kind of sat there like oh this is this is gonna be cake because you know it's three guys and they're like you know like the, the music changed like <laughs> no it's not gonna be cake um so I um I thought it went well you know I thought Juan was like listen and he did what a brother would do. I have a brother, he would do that. Like, 
if you stay on course we're good if not then you will see a different side i feel like that goes for say that goes you know that saying goes for anybody who has someone that they care about and they're kind of trusting you especially in a situation like this where we really don't know you you know um so his her friends asked other questions and kind of said hey if you're gonna be committed to this process and genuine if you you know do and and be who you say you are then you'll be fine so that was fine um you know merla met with his i don't think it was his mother um a friend i think two friends um i don't know where gil's mom is i don't know if she was at the wedding i know merla's mom was at the wedding um Merle, I mean, it was an okay brunch. It was fun. It was lighthearted. You know, Merla kind of comes off um, a little bratty. You know, I whine, I have tantrums, I'm going to do whatever. I, that probably will get on, is it Merla or Mirla? Because I keep saying Merla. Whatever. Um, so that probably will get on his nerves, I think, long term. Um, somebody's going to deal with it, but and, and he might deal with it. But I think when there is a situation that they really need to push through and she really does not want to um, move through that and, and goes into this like little tantrum, I think it won't, it won't always be cute. Like it'll be cute if it's like, babe, my feet hurt carrying me. Okay. That's cute. But if it's like, I don't want to do certain things that we really need to do, or I don't want to, you know, do this, then I don't know. I think that'll be problematic. So I was just like, okay, this lunch is okay. But it, it just feels like she's kind of like bratty. Like if I'm tired, then I'm just going to whine. And I'm like, girl we're adults here so I, I get moody because I can own that I can be moody too but it was just I don't know um what I enjoyed so flipping back to Juan Mirla's brother I enjoyed that he said that she is very financially savvy that she saves before she spends because once again Mirla gets this bad rap for being high maintenance or spending on purses and shoes the way that I feel about it is like if that's not what you like to do don't do it um, people tend to project uh, what they think or what they would do or what they can't do or whatever what they are doing onto other people and it really isn't fair now is she someone who is not taking care of herself or being irresponsible and or demanding it from someone no so why do we care you know it's just like a societal thing where we get to point the finger behind screens while we're scrolling and we get to be super judgmental i don't care she can afford it she's living a great lifestyle she takes care of herself she's responsible Marilla likes bags and shoes the end like so i cut her some slack but i know a lot of people have been really hard on her um yeah so i they continue to get along pretty much throughout the episode um and you know i think i so far so good okay you know the little stuff that happened at the uh <laughs> resort where she complained mostly about the accommodations i don't know i wasn't impressed with the accommodations either but i live in south florida so i have seen stunning stunning beautiful things beautiful places beautiful accommodations and when you think of honeymoon you often think of like oh it's just this well a lot of people I won't say you as in everyone but a lot of people kind of think of like this is the the time that we're going to be maybe a little more indulgent so I wasn't impressed either um definitely you know was edited to where she was just like a wet mop about it and he was just like really happy about it but we're already seeing the differences and how he's like wow this is great and she's like mm, I don't like that I can't see that it's dark it's murky and so sometimes how we do some things is how we do all things so her perspective might be more negative at first more glass half full possibly and his might be glass half um no, glass half empty for her and his might be glass half full. Um, another thing we see with them is the money, being driven by money. Um, I don't think either one is wrong as long as you don't value money over particular things and what you identify to be really important or do immoral or illegal things for it. If she was really poor, money drives her because, I mean, we can do the math here. We see why money drives her. Um, now if it becomes more important than her spouse or her kids or people then that's a different story but it made you know made very perfect sense why money drives her um he's on the opposite end of the spectrum though and so probably he has a different um upbringing a different relationship with money and that's really important not only when in relationships not only when you're discussing 
finances do you discuss the actual finances we we just think of discussing the number i make this you make that how do you spend this how do you want to budget that but it's about your relationship with um finances which really comes from like how you saw your parents deal with it um and then you interpret it in your own way and also your own experiences so there's a lot that they can do there and that would be like a great mediation for them um to be able to have that conversation about why money drives her why money doesn't drive him what it drives what drives him and then how they meet in the middle with that and they may not they, they may not ever meet in the middle because if you don't have a particular experience, then you won't ever understand it from that perspective. So if he didn't grow up um, in poverty, then he's never going to be driven in the same way because he does not have that experience and vice versa. Because she did grow up in that way, then she's going to value it in a way where she doesn't understand where he's coming from. So you can always also agree to disagree, but also set some boundaries within your relationship. So that's Merla and Gil. Next, we have Michaela and Zach, who got in the sack. I just came up with that, guys. Um, no surprise there, because <laughs> Michaela was getting it in like five minutes before she got that phone call that they were, um, you know, that she was chosen. So um, no surprise there. They also have like a very explosive chemistry in terms of like really being attracted to each other and not being shy about it. Um, so I there was no surprise there I I mean I don't know what whatever this is the part where it's kind of like up to each person if people don't have sex on the first night on this show um it doesn't bother me once I don't get into the oh well that's her husband or that's his wife so they have to they met five seconds ago do I like when they go so slowly and it's like six weeks in that we still can't give each other a kiss that's a little weird you probably shouldn't have tried out for this but you know to each their own if they move quickly um they have that right however i will just say that in my opinion um lust often distracts us and creates this inability to be able to see um some things because we're so blinded by it so that may be a problem in the future for them just jumping in so fast like i don't think anything's wrong with it i'm just saying if we're thinking about it, um, jumping in so fast might might hinder um, the ability to see. And I think that not only in this experience, um, in general, you know, how many times have people gotten caught up in the lust of it and it extends the relationship or it creates a relationship that never should have been created simply because the sex is great. Like, so that's, that's a thing. But no surprise there. Um, they are still super cute together. Um, her didn't her uh brunch with his family was very sweet the fact that his uh dad asked her to dance that was that touched my heart guys that really really did because if you know me and you know my history then you know why um but it was very very sweet and that is such a like a family gesture you know like if you were sitting somewhere and it was like dads grab your daughters your uncle would grab you or a grandfather or you know godfather that was just such a sweet thing for him to take the initiate the initiative to do and make her feel welcome um mama has spoiled them boys because <laughs> it's obvious like dad is like throwing shade they're mama's boys um but they have a sweet disposition the brothers are all in like everyone seemed um engaged and kind of like we we love him we care about him and he has a family unit that supports him and we're we're bringing you into our family but we want to know that he's with someone who cares about him and who's here for the right reasons and who is serious um i love that dad asked how do you um handle conflict resolution and she was honest in saying listen i didn't get the best um i didn't get the best example her answer was like i don't know her answer was like a great answer but i don't think it was like a real answer because all I could think of was like, I've heard about Hurricane K. So <laughs> I, I don't know that your conflict resolution is probably as prim and proper. It, she said like what you should have said, um, but it didn't feel real because ideally it's like, well, these are the things that I try to do. And a lot of times I try to do X, Y, Z, but it doesn't always work that way. It was kind of like, this is what I would do. And I'm like, mm, that's, you're probably not doing that, but it's good that you have the framework for it. Um, my husband and I always talk about rules of engagement. So when you are angry, 
have some rules as a couple that you set in stone so that if and when you do pass it, you at least know that it's there. Like, draw the line. You don't know where the line is if you never draw it. So it's not to say that in a heated argument, you won't cross a boundary, but more than likely, you won't. And if you do, then you recognize it and then you can, you know, go back and, and handle that. But a lot of times, if you've set these parameters, then unless it's just one of those arguments where it's just, you can't calm down, a lot of times you will set the parameters and you will feel the parameters that you're getting close to them. So that's just really important if you haven't seen, um, you know, healthy conflict resolution, that's just something. Set some rules so that you know, hey, this is not what I want to do. And if we get to this certain point, then let's, you know, let's cut it or let's do X, Y, Z, or here's the things that we don't want to do. Um, so that's that. Uh, Zach meeting with his sisters. I think he, meeting with her sisters, I'm sorry. I think he fits right in with them. Um, once again, they let it be known, hey, we've protected her. She's the baby. She's always had someone. And I don't think she even realizes how much she's had someone because when we're all adults, we're kind of like, I'm an adult. I'm doing things myself. I'm handling myself. But you, you never know how dependent and not in an unhealthy way just the dynamic you are with your siblings and always knowing that they're there so in a way you are always protected whether you realize it or not so here we're handing you our baby essentially I mean she's our sister but she's the baby sister and we've all kind of looked out for her um so you know um look out for her and him asking hey what's the best way what advice do you have for me I think that is the the best way to go about it I really do not like when I think married at first sight needs to stop like forcing these let's tell them the bad stuff you know I think it's really important for good advice like when her sister said hey if she's passionate about something if she's excited about something be passionate with her like because it, it it's important that you're excited with your spouse that's that's huge and that's something that a lot of us can work on like not just getting so used to kind of the voice of your spouse that you kind of drown it out and you're like okay but like really okay they're really excited that's something that we can work on that's good advice versus like she's messy she's crazy he's you know which which we get in the vows and they're supposed to be cheeky and funny but they really just create this thing where you start looking for this stuff so I, I wish they would stop doing that because I think it's Dutch stop doing that because I think it's more detrimental than it is fun or helpful um so moving on we have Jose and Rachel and they make me think of the point that I just made because when Jose met with her family you know she they kind of said hey uh she she kind of holds on to things with the mental notes things and she's a complete mess and you know Jose is like super organized and a, a neat freak so that starts freaking him out I feel like little things like that just let them find out on their own let him get into her dirty car and he'll know it's dirty when he gets into it but let's not really set the tone the night after they meet each other for the for the first time with all this stuff let's give them advice that would be beneficial um like when she meets with his family hey he's really serious about his finances he has an excel sheet like you know financial um responsibility is really important for him that's important because finances are big okay um so that's better advice to me than you know what jose has a scroll with 250 questions that he wants to ask you on the honeymoon uh somebody's gonna miss the flight at this point you know let's like leave the petty stuff out maybe they just do it for um maybe they just do it for you know the tv the drama of it all but i think it it creates this thing where now i can't even just experience you i'm looking for what they said was there you know and they did that a lot with rihanna last season with the bossy thing and you know they're kind of doing it and i just don't think it's helpful um so that bothers me that they do that but the other advice that they were giving was great jose and rachel have great chemistry um they have great chemistry. They're easy to watch. They're getting along. They're bantering back and forth. They're making little jokes. Um, you know, when she's hyper focusing on this is going so well that it's too good to be true, it's very um, reflective of how dysfunctional we have become in, in relationships that we don't recognize when it's a good one. Now, I'm not saying that this one is perfect, but in seeing her say that, I've seen so many people say that. And it's simply because they have not learned how to 
engage in a healthy relationship. And so when they get to one, it doesn't feel right because the comfort of dysfunction is what they're accustomed to. So it's really important, and I give that advice for you all, it's really important to manage um, healthy relationships by recognizing you know, the, the part that you've played in dysfunctional relationships, whether you were acting in them or allowing them to occur and sit in the discomfort of a newly healthy relationship. Well, what's wrong with them? Like, it's fine now, girl. Like, something will happen because that's life and relationships and you'll be fine. Um, but just looking for that, that's that's something that a lot of us have probably done where we're like, oh, this, he, he showed up on time. He called me back. And it's like, you're so damaged by p past relationships or that that you can't recognize when what's supposed to be happening is happening. So that's my little two cents for Rachel and Jose. Um, probably other stuff happened, y'all, but I don't even remember. I just wanted to share that because that was something that really stuck out to me. Um, so next we have Brett and, um, Brett and Ryan. Brett and Ryan. Um, <laughs> this week felt a little awkward. Did it feel awkward for you guys? Ryan's um, lunch with with her family felt a little awkward but I guess what we're picking up on is that Ryan is shy so um, that kind of quiet nature or not really knowing what to say or not really filling in the silence or um, just saying you know redheads are either attractive or not and then kind of just leaving it at that <laughs> with her parents it was just like I could hear like I can hear everything because it's silent. So everything that's going on, we can hear. Um, I think that Ryan is sweet though. And I think it'll be more interesting to see him when he kind of breaks out of his shell because you'll see him banter back and forth with her, which she's pretty good at. And he's funny. He says like funny little quirky things. Um, I can't read Ryan fully yet because we know Brett is not his type. Um, and I think navigating that is going to be interesting he even said hey you know if, if I went on a date and someone acted like this on a plane then there would be there wouldn't be another date so we're gonna have to see because Ryan is quoted as the serial dater which I think he jokingly said there's some small towns he can't go back to right so he even identifies as a serial dater so we're really gonna have to see how he does moving forward um because he's sticking with it right he's married he is committed he said listen, I don't want to do this again when he when he was talking to her parents. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how he sticks with it and navigates someone who isn't necessarily his type, but he's attracted to and he's enjoying. Same thing for um, same thing for Brett. And I found it interesting when she met with his friends um, for lunch, when she was saying, you know, I want him to get to know the real me, which I think is really important because she said, I don't want him to get to know the carbon copy or whatever. I want him to get to know the real me so that he is not, you know, attracted or falling in love with someone who doesn't really exist, which is really important because, you know, a lot of us can do that where you kind of present a certain way or I think it was Rachel in her confessional a few episodes ago that said she kind of morphed into whatever the person she was dating wanted her to be. So, so that's really important. I want to see who that is though, Brett, you know, because the, sometimes the way she was saying it, I was like, God, what, what is she going to reveal or what is there? So, um, they're still like the even keel, very calm couple. Um, so I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, so far, so, so good, I guess. Um, I think they have more differences based on what I'm seeing, um, than similarities though. So it, it is going to be an adjustment for the both of them. So let me know what you guys think because because that's that's pretty much what I have for Brett and Ryan All right, last we have Bao and Johnny. So Bao and Johnny. I'm really liking Bao and Johnny um, I think for someone who is not touchy-feely they have had uh, moments of intimacy that that really I wasn't expecting you know because you know her saying touch is so low on the totem pole that's really like I could sit next to you and not really touch you and be just fine so I saw touches of intimacy and just hand holding or laying on each other or being close that I thought was really sweet um I thought that their 
what is it their brunches were pretty nice um johnny's mom got so emotional that he found someone and and his his aunts were really sweet um it just seemed like a very intimate very special dinner them welcoming her and you know the cultural components for the both of them are really important so she touched about um how important it is that you uh speak to them in a in a particular way and and introduce yourself in a particular way i forgot how she said it but they're very intentional and very respectful and it's not just about them as it is just their culture as well and wanting to represent that in a very important way so i think they're taking this very well um i don't know at the end of that brunch though when his aunt kind of joked about him being a stay-at-home <laughs> a stay-at-home dad um you know, Bao didn't laugh at that. So I, I don't I don't know what's going on with that. I don't know if she just threw that out there to like freak her out or if that's something that they've discussed and that's what Johnny wants to do. I don't see that Johnny wants to do that, but it was just funny because she was like, <laughs> like, okay. And then it was like, cut, let's break. So um, that was sweet. Uh, seeing Johnny kind of talk to her brother and her friends, uh, that was really good too. And really getting into it. The friend didn't let him up. Like, okay, if you're a serial dater, because essentially Johnny said, yep, yeah, I've gone on a lot of first dates. How could you be married? Like, you know, let's have a real dialogue. How could you be married? What's going to be essentially different about this? And he says, because I can't leave. I'm committed. I'm married. And with the first date, you can leave. You don't have to have a second date. Um, they also talked about Bao's response to his uh, gift and um, her, like her getting really worked up. I thought that was a horrible gift, guys. I, I did. And for a woman that you don't, I feel like sports stuff is only a shoe in for a person that you know enjoys sports. Um, he didn't know her. I feel like just take a safer direction. Um, and that would have landed a little bit better because if I would have gotten a sport thing, I would have been like, literally would have been the look on my face. I would have been like, really? So this is what I'm possibly gonna have to deal with the rest of my life? Like there was not something sweet and maybe sweet and thoughtful for him. But once again, you don't know this person, therefore it doesn't land the same. Um, but yes, Bao did get worked up. She barely almost made it down the aisle, but um, it was interesting that he said that he hopes that she doesn't get worked up like that. Um, and we'll see. I think Bao has the potential to get worked up like that over little things, but we'll see how they navigate that. And it was very cute how they were going back and forth with um, her Excel sheet and packing and how, you know, he had these lists and she's like, one up him times 10 with an excel sheet so i th thought thought that that was funny the best part for me honestly was at the end where they were talking about sex in bed because not not necessarily because they were talking about sex but it's a it was a great picture of how um some someone who's the opposite of you can help open you up and can help you evolve um, she said, hey, I am, but he, do, he's doing it in a respectful way where he's kind of like just checking to see if you're open. He is your husband now, but not necessarily pushing you. And um, I thought it was like a good example of how they could really grow together because he is saying, well, you know, I want to take it slow. I want to be respectful. So he is recognizing her needs. I want to take it slow. I want to be respectful. If there's anything that you're ever uncomfortable with, please let me know she really is appreciative of his respect for that so now he's gonna now she's gonna give him some of his needs which is answering that question we've seen people in the past like clam up about sex or even if there's a question they don't want to talk about it but his approach and her comfort level made her say you know what i normally doesn't don't talk about this but let me just okay this is what i like and then they start joking about what they like and what they don't like and then guess what guess who doesn't need a body pillow as a barrier bow doesn't you know and it's sweet and it just showed evolution um and, and then the ability to kind of meet each other even if you aren't in the same place um and i'll close with this last not last year like many years ago I was listening to a sermon called um, God's perfect plan for marriage and I never forgot the pastor saying um, 
the perfect marriage, which there isn't, but he was, you know, that was the name of the thing. The perfect marriage is two servants in love because if they're always working on serving each other, i.e. giving each other their needs or working on it or acknowledging it, then they won't ever be empty because if you're pouring into your spouse and your spouse is pouring into you and that's the focus, then you'll be willing to kind of continue to do the same. So you see pouring in, pouring in, like we're meeting in the middle versus pouring in and not getting anything or pouring in, not getting anything or like completely disconnected because I'm over it, you know? So I think that's really important and I thought that that was a beautiful example of that. All right, guys, <laughs> that's it. I hope you enjoyed this review. As always, do not forget to subscribe, comment, and share. And I will talk to you guys next week. Everyone have a wonderful weekend.